Broadcasting from the commodity capital of the world, Zurich, Switzerland, this is Insider's Guide to Energy. Insider's Guide to Energy, ETRM Mini Series, brought to you by Fedectus, where post trading matters, and falls an independent management and consulting beauty, creating impacts for clients and markets. Welcome to Insider's Guide to Energy ETRM mini series. The extension of the series goes on. Today, we are proud to have with us Inuit. And from Inuit, we have Ganesh. Ganesh, how do you say your last name? Ganesh Natasi. Ganesh Natasi, uh, COO of Inuit. And with you, you brought along Sunil and Sunil Kalamurthy? Sinu Kalamurthy. All right. We may be editing that. <laughs> I apologize. I, I, I'm bad with that. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to today's program. Um, excited to have you in the ETRM mini series. For if you're new to the mini series, what we've done in the ETRM mini series is we've gone to a number of vendors across the industry. I think we've already interviewed more than 13 vendors, and each one has been taken through the same framework. We start out by talking about the industry broadly. And the first thing that comes to my mind that I've asked every vendor so far is I started the ETRM mini series with Martin because we were looking at the industry and we just saw so much activity, so much smoke and so many people and so much hype of going on startups and investment into it. So my question to you is what's happening in ETRM today to get all this attention? What, what's, what's changing the market today for ETRM? So I think I can take that one um, from from my perspective. Uh, glad to be here, guys. Um, from from a ETRM or a CTRM standpoint, mainly on the ETRM side, there's a lot of volatility happening in the marketplace, right? So the last two years, we all know that we have been with COVID, and then uh, predominantly majority of the workforces who are actually in the trading business and ops business are currently not able to coordinate face to face on their offices. That's one thing. Uh, second thing, which is pushing a sophisticated system or more of a technology landscape is a need to support hybrid or a remote working is pushing forward the market uh, in two aspects. One is energy volatility. The price is going up and down EU gas. Uh, there's a lot of short term power opportunities on the European side. The same thing goes in the US side. So you can comment on it. Uh, at the same time, uh, people are actually looking for platforms and ways to collaborate without actually leaving their home. So if any of the organizations who are actually not invested in a technology infrastructure or an IT infrastructure per se to run their trading and operations business is actually forced to move out of that comfort zone and try to rely more on systems and technologies to, to run their business, right? That's actually the two broad macroeconomic elements which is actually pushing the uh, market forward in terms of ETRM systems and sophistications and anything else you want to ask. The third thing which I see personally is from the assessment of the vendor perspective, um, what is actually the questions the clients are looking for is, you know, always a decade ago or even uh, five years ago, the way of questions which people ask us in the market in your typical RFP or RFP response is much different than what they are asking us today. So what is any client is looking for? They're looking for five parameters. Any system they're looking for or any technology they're looking for to support their trading business, they are looking at whether the solution is functionally fit, right? Uh, functionally fit doesn't mean just it meets my user's requirements, technical as well as functionally fit. Second, they are looking for a good architecture, which means you know, how, how your solution is open enough to move the data around for them to actually capitalize on an investment. It's no more a defensive spend if you invest in an ETRM system. It's more of a proactive spend to actually manage your data and then data become insights, insights becomes money for any of the trading businesses. It's as simple as that. So people are realizing that it's no more an IT solution per se, it's almost a business solution or always been a business solution, but the realization is coming to a much more clarity right now. Third, they are actually looking for a good architecture where they are able to extract the data in and out of the system so that they can move the data around what's the value of the being data being logged into a single platform, right? 
it doesn't make any sense. You need to be able to move the data around within your businesses to make some good good decisions. Fourth, like always, since the market is volatile, people are looking for more with less attitude. What I mean by that is people are looking for openness, good architecture, great, uh, great value proposition, multi-commodity strategy, and good, good vendor who can actually take their journey and make them realize their investment, right? I think the ask is very clear in the market from anybody we talk to, whether you are talking to some big conglomerate or you're talking to somebody who is just starting up a shop to start just trading emissions or uh, power, I think the ask is very, very clear. People actually know what they don't want to buy in this market. They actually know what they want to buy from an ETRM solution standpoint. Does that give you kind of a short brief, Chris? It does, yeah. it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you mentioned already a lot of um reasons why the ETM um, market and uh, the space is changing and you covered um, technology which is from my point of view one big aspect why uh, solutions are changing but you also mentioned more or dived a little bit deeper into uh, the business aspects you mentioned volatility but also the knowing what to trade and what not to trade um, but maybe let's 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 dive a little bit deeper into there so the business side uh, if I'm a trader or a mid-office guy or back office um, user. Um, Absolutely, right. I mean, what is the, the clear uh, view from, from, from the business side? Is it that the business is changing? One password can be renewables here, uh, which drives also then the requirements towards a ETM solution. So what is your view from a business point of view, from a business perspective towards the changes for an ETM system? So I think, I think from a business standpoint of view, right, uh, I, I actually, worked with many businesses, not only energy before, and so does Sino. I, I believe the the lines getting blurred every day in every way, right? You have a front office which which still looks at positions, 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 you have a risk, and you have a front office traders looking at PL, ops is looking for earlier scheduling and nominations, back office is looking for your accounting and settlements, right? I think the traditional front, middle, back, back office or operations still exist. But the connectedness from the business is much more demanding than a decade or a five years before, right? As an ops person, the ops person actually need to know from their perspective, the immediate impact of their p &L on their operational cost when a trader makes a decision, right? Previously, it used to be not that crucial. For us, uh, from a business standpoint, uh, between this set of users, including IT, they are all looking for much more connectedness in terms of workflows strike through processing in terms of the benefits and how they can actually work on the same data front to back without actually making a phone call or emailing you saying that, hey, is this correct? So the connectedness and the workflow and the strike through processing actually drives a lot of collaboration because coming back to my point, right? I've not seen a lot of people in the last two years. I did see, but not at the way you're walking into the trading floor and then looking at everybody, you're able to do a whiteboarding and then try to understand and solve a problem statement. Right now, that's what uh, business is expecting. So IT becomes a much more enabler for the business to solve this connectedness and collaborative attitude using the ETRM system. And people are also looking for, you know, if you look at the last 24 months or 36 months trend, a lot of businesses are actually investing in IT and digital transformations, which means they're trying to understand the whole blueprint about the value of data across the value chain. So from a business standpoint, people are getting much more tech savvy not only it should be able to meet their business needs, they're also trying to optimize my time because everybody's working from home by using having good advanced workflows which seamlessly connect the dots between front to back, right? Those demands are actually more and more um, and people are actually pushing for a lot more workflows within the product rather than actually, uh, you know, risk and other stuff which is given in these days, right? Does that answer your question, Martin? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you want to add something? Yeah. Yeah. So, since uh, Martin Martin also talked about renewables and how how that uh, you know uh, how that's in play in the current market, you know, it, renewables and environmental is is huge. There's existing you know our existing clients or new inquiries. There's a lot of activity, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of growth in the in the environmental business. You know, and not just the cap, regular cap and trade regulated business, but there's voluntary business driven by ESG that people, you know, people on the on the consumer side and the producer side 
or actively involved and if that involvement is only going to become more and more and higher and higher and that that makes systems a lot more critical in managing these things especially the growing side you know on the, on the voluntary voluntary uh, business and also the markets itself like the power markets the power prices are now heavily driven by the uh, renewable side of uh, you know the the that's more regulated, but then power markets are disrupted. And, and, all, and in terms of what they dispatch, you know, the dispatch decision, do I want to run my plant or do, you know, is it, is, uh, you know, wind power available? Is solar power, there's more storage available in the market. So all that is making, is basically disrupting the market. Now they, they need to be a little more nimble. They need more information, more real time data to, to work on, you know, on the part, on the, on the environmental side to keep up with it, right? So, and, you know, from systems perspective, they want to, you know, not only capture and value their environmental side of, side of uh, transactions, but they want to manage the, the operation side of it. The operations, it's, it's surprisingly complex, you know, if, if you're doing it manually and you, some, you know, they need uh, more streamlined systems on that and, and they want to bundle the commodities and so, uh, so on and so forth. So I think, you know, environmentals is, is huge in the market. And, you know, and, and from end trade, Inuit end trade perspective, we, we are really building out solutions. We already have a lot of solutions. Yeah, go ahead. So, so I think what I heard was a, a number of points that you thought from a market perspective. Um, I, I, I captured that, you know, there was remote work was one element that was important. I captured that the the data that that maybe decisions are being made is kind of data driven decisions. I think what you implied, and that each of the group or stakeholders are there now. Is that unique and changing? I mean, it sounds like you know there's you know that there's a lot of things, and you talked about the renewables and the RECs and, and the ESG initiative. Are these things that are just recently popping up, and then are these things that the older ETRM or legacy ETRM systems aren't capable of handling? In your opinion, is there a need for change, or what, what's happening? I, I think there is a need for change, Chris, because older ETM systems, there is, I've, I've seen solutions that, that is shoehorning, that you try to shoehorn environmental products into existing solutions and, and, and make it work. Yes, it could work to a certain ex extent from the traditional products perspective, but then as the industry evolves into, into more sophisticated markets and they have their own characteristics, now, you know, the existing ETRMs, or if you're trying to shoehorn it into existing products, it, at some point you are now going into a product where you're making compromises on the functionality. You are trying to do, introduce more manual processes to make it work. And a dedicated solution is, is required at this point. That, you know, it, it has been there for a long time, environmental solutions, and it has worked in the existing ETRM systems because they are very regulated, very, uh, easy to understand markets, very simple. Now it is getting a lot more complex and project-based, ESG-based uh, solutions and there's, there's lack of price visibility and there's, uh, you know, there's, there's a, you know, the, the operational process itself is changing. Earlier it's certificates that's coming into registry, you, you value it at inventory and then you, you deliver the certificate. Now there is uh, a lot more going on. There's a lot of tracking from the point of uh, production to point of delivery. And all that, if you want to do that, you would need a dedicated solution. And somebody, whoever comes up with a more dedicated, more, uh, you know, that, that understands the market's needs and that understands what's coming in the market and, and produces solutions are going to be the ones that are going to provide real value to the customers and not necessarily making them do all the manual work. You know, ETM will be there, but there will be a lot of manual work around it, and that defeats uh, some of the, uh, you know, the, the purpose of you know growth in this market. You you need to if you want to grow, there needs to be value. Yeah. Okay, understood. Ahead, maybe it's a maybe it's a good uh, point in time to do, uh, and kind of to to talk about um, what is Enuit offering in that uh, transforming market, and um, also. Um, yeah, having in mind, as you said, that uh, the complexity in the market is getting higher. So happy to hear about your solutions and um, what you offer specifically for the complexity and the changes that you mentioned. Thank you for that question, Martin. I really appreciate it because that's something that I've been spending a lot of time on and we have worked on that uh, solution and we're proud to uh, you know, talk about it. So you know, not, we, we always have the capability to capture 
the environmental traits value them very well and we have a great risk system. Now, what we, what we have added is a dedicated module where in a single process, you could deliver the inventory, you know, whatever's coming in and value, you know, value the inventory at market, keep the, keep the value up while you're creating the settlement parameters for the purchase and sales deal. So, you know, a lot of times when a purchase comes in, when you when you deliver it into inventory, you have to go and start settling. You know, do do some work on the purchase or the sales side to to make sure the settlements come out correctly. We kind of made it all into one one step. We have a dedicated inventory delivery module, and that we have built. So we have an environmental deal type, and we have an environmentally environmental inventory type. Those are unique to environmental products. So that's the start, and then we have an environmental delivery module where you can deliver the products in one step and that will spawn a set of activities that will help you settle the deals correctly and also man, man, value your inventories at, at, the, at the right level and you could capture your inventory and, and compare it to your registries. Like basically you can set up your inventory to mirror the registry and so you can basically go look at it and you know, all right, my balances look, look correct. So, and we are also working with currently working with a lot of vendors to how we can integrate through the registry itself so that that reconciliation can become seamless. So that's the part we have, we have, we have done it. And along with it, we have also uh, introduced bundling modules to all our physical commodities business wherever renewables are applicable. So you could bundle renewable commodities along with your physical business that will manage, that will create and manage the environmental trade and track the uh, valuation on those. And you could unbundle it to take it as inventory or keep it bundled. And so we, we've created that module. And you know that. And then we're also working on with vendors to create some price visibility on the voluntary businesses. There's project-based businesses. And there's, you know, there's, when, once you start getting into project-based businesses, you know, valuing them and tracking them and capturing the project parameters, that becomes very challenging, and so we are kind of, kind of staying ahead of it and trying to trying to work with vendors to see how much visibility we can create around prices in that area, and also, you know, what are the projects and, and how can we create more standardized data in that area. Okay, understood. Uh, I I heard you mentioning um, several times inventory, uh, so that that uh, brings me to to um, to to the thinking that um, you have a strong uh, or your solutions can handle uh, CO2 tradings or also uh, GOO, for example, very well, where you have to take care of the inventory. So is that your 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 special focus um, of your system solutions, or do you also support, let's say, the more traditional assets and uh, the tradings uh, around it, like power, gas, uh, oil, coal, etc.? The inventory is certainly a sweet spot and somebody that has mm -hmm. struggled with tracking uh, different types of environmental products would really love the offering that we, that we provide, which kind of centralizes everything. And so inventory is a sweet spot, but we've been traditionally strong on the conventional uh, commodity markets, the uh, physical markets as well. So we have a strong product around it. Now what we have done is we've integrated environmental products along with those physical commodity products to 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 make sure I, I think I can add some color to it. See. Now that's that's what's happening in the market. I, I can just add some color to it, um, Martin. So a couple yeah. of things, right? So previously, five years before, emissions market still existed, right? It was not new, right? Rex and RINs and all of those stuff existed in the U.S. We have EUA carbon emissions. People talked about it, but that was more of a compliance exercise. I would just say a decade ago, we had, you know, we didn't have a big. Uh, push on uh, net zero or a carbon neutral environment. But the, the emissions market always existed. As, as Sinu rightly pointed out, what people are looking for right now is no more a paper exercise. Oh, I have a I have an emissions commission, you know, emission compliance by actually booking some emissions deals. People are pushing through the value chain of deal. For example, I'll just take a simple example. If I'm a metals or a mining company where I'm digging my earth, and actually trying to produce metals. I, I know it's an energy conference, but I'm actually trying to give a bit of an example. People are willing to track their carbon emissions from the time they're digging the earth all the way towards the metals is made, right? So the push is towards almost treat your emissions, as Sinu said, 
across the value chain where is my carbon emissions across my deal life cycle if it's a physical commodity company am i actually uh, you know built you know making metals out of earth and what is the carbon value chain throughout what is my carbon accounting looks like so the demands we are just scratching the surface as a market right environmental is a huge scope for every etr vendor including enovit but there is a much more holistic purpose about integrating that carbon emissions across the true value chain and enovit is fully positioned to do that because we handle more than 13 to 14 commodities in a single platform including energy and gas right it's not only energy and gas we do we do physicals metals iron ore coal lng everything every of the physical commodity players are worried about carbon emissions and they would like to track them as a part of a value chain so when 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 sino says we are looking at the delivery angle he is mean the full value chain it's not just a paper exercise anybody for the market is that a right thing to say sino yeah absolutely absolutely so we the, those businesses are intertwined now and the intertwined nature needs to be represented in the system and that's what we're doing with the existing physical commodities business now yeah okay and in in that context what are your target clients is it like uh, large uh, uh, power producers or i mean i also heard that uh, you might also um, you might also have a strong focus on more metal producing companies or any uh, company that has to manage their emissions well so what is your target client group so uh it's not just target the existing target client groups as well it's uh, we we power is certainly an industry that's been dis disrupted and that is a target client target group for sure but renewable natural gas is huge and there's you know and and, and especially in some geographies there are local regulations that help those uh, markets so renewable natural gas is big and renewable lng is is huge as well you know end of the day it becomes natural gas so on that on that end there is a lot of uh, renewable linkage going on uh, bundling going on because everybody wants to be carbon neutral which means you know the you know whatever is the carbon intensity of the of whatever they are burning or selling they want to link equal amount of carbon off offsets to it so renewable natural gas lng power and and you know and biogas and and what not all, all that is is there's a lot of interest in that area and also you know people that are trading uh, just the just the environmental product by itself that is the i mean if you look at the market obviously there is this physical players that that look at it as a holistic perspective but there is a 80% of the players which are just trading in this market and they want good capacity to understand all the different types of products be able to bring them in value them seamlessly and and get it in inventory reconcile with the certificate you know with the registries and you know you know if you're if you're trading huge volumes operations becomes a major bottleneck and you know you, you know so that can be you know if you have a system that kind of very seamlessly integrates to that process all the way to the settlement that would be a huge uh, you know cost savings and not you know not only in terms of uh, you know operational efficiency you can save real real cost in full time employees if you have good good uh, you know solution so so i think what i'm hearing you say you you keep mentioning bundles in in, in bits and pieces and you just kind of gave a description of kind of a full in solution right so you you mm -hmm. kind of almost soup to nuts have the solution where i i think i've picked up from the conversation you you you're working with partners some ecosystems to, to natively bring some components in so so are these companies then are they looking to buy their entire solution for you i mean one of the things i've seen in in many the large trading organizations is they have multiple ETRM systems, they have, you know, more specialized for, you know, metals maybe, and then they have one that's power and gas, and, and, and they really are a mix and match, you know, it's seldom do I see everybody just having a monolithic system for the very large players. Are you trying to build one system, one modular system for these folks to meet their entire demand? Is that your vision? Yes, that is our vision. We, we want to, in, we, you know, Entered, I will let uh, Ganesh talk I can to take how one. we are a overall a global solution. Yes. Right, Ganesh. I can take that one. So I, I think, um, you know, um, Chris, you brought a very interesting point, right? Uh, you know, some of the large ones where the traditional trading houses used to have best of breed systems. That was a term which is used always in the market, right? I want to go buy a metal solution, I'll buy one, LNG, I'll buy one and stuff. I think that's where exactly any which sweet spot is, right? As I said at the earlier part of the call, we handle more than 13 plus commodities in a single solution base. 
that puts us in a very unique position for us because if anyone is currently doing an IT revamp or a business revamp in terms of actually optimizing or rationalizing their current platform, then Enuit has actually become the choice because we 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 kind of one of the market leaders on the marketplace to really handle power, gas, LNG, metals, iron ore, any other global commodities in a single solution. Your question opened up two interesting elements, right? Ecosystems, right? Ecosystems can be perceived in three different ways, right? One is if I'm a if as if I'm a client or a trading company who has got uh, invested in the existing IT products, I think the first thing I would really worry if I have to wear a hat of a CEO for a trading house or a IT director of a trading house, the first hat I will wear is if I'm going to bring in another solution like Anivit or anybody like Anivit, is it going to complement my existing investment or it's going to hurt my existing investment, the sunk cost, right? That's the first question I will always ask as IT director, as a CEO, right? The ecosystem comes into play if you choose that kind of a product like Anivit or similar to Anivit, and you actually know how to leverage the data and how open the product is to connect into your landscape is the key, right? Right now, whether you are a small company or a big company, your existing IT infrastructure, if it is, unless it is too old, it is very, very hard to get rid of the existing knowledge base, exiting sunk cost you put in and maintaining your lights on for the organization. So when you're actually working with vendors or partners like Enuit, you need to really think about ecosystem in terms of how can the new product like Enuit collaborate with my ecosystem? That's one element of the angle. The second thing is if I'm actually going to spin up a couple of different ETRM systems to solve my best of breed problems, how can I actually connect these systems together so that I can have an aggregated risk or aggregated view as a business? I think ecosystem goes both ways. How as a new solution get fit into my product or how I'm going to make all of these new solutions or modules to sing and dance together. I think you asked a very interesting question. What steps Enuit is taking towards it? I think that's where the crux of it. Uh, Senior is from a product development team. And then, um, you know, we have our CPO in our business. So we basically are always trying to break even our product into a standalone microservices so that your ecosystem actually gets completed in terms of, okay, I have an accounting ecosystem or a microservice, or I have some capabilities to do some market integration with trading technologies or any other uh, market venues. So when you spin off these independent elements as a microservices, it's very, very easy to fit in into a client ecosystem based on the technology trend as well as what is that gap which is missing, we can actually do it. So from a overall, from a product standpoint, we still keep the product close to our chest, which means that we actually know what we are doing with our product. We still keep our product more open every single day in terms of to fit into the client's ecosystem. Hope that kind of gives you a picture of ecosystem in two dimension, Chris. Make sense? Perfect. It does. Yeah, I think that that goes in the in the direction where the new technology of the market is, uh, is, is moving towards so micro a service-based architecture, um, maybe in that context. So uh, is, is, is your solutions or solutions, on, is, is it cloud native? Uh, do you offer it uh, purely on cloud or? So, you so we, we offer that? our solution fully on cloud, but cloud native yeah. as in is, it is born out of cloud, the answer is no, right? But we are moving towards, uh, you know, re-architecting some of our next generation of product to be cloud native. Right now we are fully hosted on the cloud. We support MS Azure and AWS both. Uh, predominantly mm -hmm. Microsoft Azure is hosted. And uh, basically we are looking at a lot of uh, cloud capabilities like workflows, um, messaging bus, like your logic apps, existing capabilities and tools provided by Microsoft to, to launch and add, take more advantage of the cloud. So we are fully hosted and we actually do both our hosting solution as any of it. And if the clients wants to host in their private cloud, we support that too. So there is no hard and fast rules here. Okay, understood. And coming back to the um, ecosystem or microservice-based uh, approach, so how does it look for a client if uh, if a client uh, decides to go with Enuit? Um, is it that he can really choose the single models that uh, is beneficial for, for the business or is there a certain um, underlying basic uh, product and, and suite that he has to choose and then can add some modules on top of it? Right. So um, just, to, just to give you a little bit of a background, right? So right, right now, since I said uh, at the start of the conversation, 
Anuit is offered currently as a holistic solution with some couple of add-on microservices, which is which is complementing to our core architecture of the core product, right? Like an accounting microservice or a market connect microservice. All of those things exist, which can be spun up independently. But are we fully cloud native enough or are we fully every element of the product is a microservices architecture? The answer is no, because if, if, if you think about it, handling 13 different commodities, 13 different logistics, 13 different pricing elements and risk engine. So we have we have to move on this journey very carefully because we have actually been one of the market leaders on the multi-commodity system. So the core solution is not split up into 100 different microservices, if that's your answer is, right? But our core solution is geared mm -hmm. to start spinning new microservices to fit into the client ecosystem. That that path we are already taking. Next okay, answer. understood. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. And um, I mean, you mentioned also before the whole challenge of uh, integrating solutions and microservices, um, which is coming, of course, more and more important um, for clients looking into microservice-based architecture. So how do you approach this challenge? Um, do you leave that to the client when the client uh, decides to go with uh, some any solutions? Or do you also have the capabilities and the know-how to, to design um, yeah, the, the trading landscape, so interfaces, data flow, workflow processes. So how do you support there the clients? Right. So there are, there are a couple of ways to cut this question, right? Let me cut the question from an Inuit response standpoint. If a client is actually coming to us and say, hey, I am looking for an ETRM system. I have a greenfield. I have nothing, but I have some legacy systems which I want you to actually work with me, try to come up with an optimal IT roadmap, right? So the first answer would that be is, are we capable enough to do that? Yes. Right, that's definitely the answer. Is it our primary job as ETRM vendor? Sometimes no, but we can definitely do that because we have product architect services teams, implementation teams, business analysts who understand the business side of things and deep technical side of things and our product and the market, right? From a skill set perspective, there's no nothing is stopping us engaging the customer in that angle. But this market, as you know, uh, Martin and Chris, is always like, you know, there is always some consulting companies trying to look for consulting element of work, for the ETRM vendors, we actually come up with our product and then we are basically trying to put together a solution in a time scale and in a project in a constrained manner in terms of budget as well as timelines. And there is also an internal IT team within the client side, some of most of the times is trying to adopt to the new technology which you are currently procuring, right? I think the answer to that is, as Inuit can take on the journey, yes, but it's actually a joint journey between the client IT, if the one exists, right? And Inuit as a product vendor to go together to actually try to fit in the Inuit and the associated microservices strategy into the landscape, right? There is no silver bullet answer saying that this is the best way to do it. From a team wise, we can definitely support it. And then okay. from a ecosystem partnering type of role, what kind of partners do you have in your ecosystem? What does what the ecosystem look like? Uh, partners as in developing the microservices kind of partners, or you're talking about uh, someone who is actually working with us? To, to build new modules. Um, yeah, do you have other modules and other services that are third party coming into your- Right, so, 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 okay, I'll take the question. I think Sino can expand on it if, as needed, right? So right now we are actually uh, having conversation with multiple partners to say, hey, this is what Innovate is and there are a lot of people who are interested in actually partnering with us. Uh, but as I said, the core product strategy right now is we, we keep our product roadmap in alignment with what we where we want to go. We are open for partners to actually come back and say, hey, um, you know, if you're going in working in, I'm, I'm just giving in a random example. If you're going to work in a Japanese power market, I actually have a standalone microservice which can actually complement your product. We are very, very open or we are very open to actually do some joint development with that kind of partners, which we are in conversation with many of them right now. But so far, as we speak today, I think the overall product management strategy is very close to what Inuit is, where Inuit is going, but we are very, very open to work with any set of partners who could actually complement and push the product strategy forward in the marketplace for us. Right. Okay. Yeah. So also, you know, and, and so from product perspective, Inuit is, you know, we, we have the skill set inside. So our products are built essentially mainly by Inuit, but from data perspective, right? So when you're talking about natural gas scheduling, uh, pipeline data rates, and this, we don't want to get into some, some level of complexity on the data side, 
there we look for partnerships and you know there are some data partners we're looking at where we could we could get all the market data and all the very niche data and also on the environmental side projects and and the price visibilities on the voluntary uh, you know environmental market so those are areas where we look for partnership from product development perspective we feel like we have a very strong team we have a very strong quantitative team so we we build a product but we are certainly open to you know some some niche areas where you know the, the you know there's already very adopted technology that we want to get into we're, we're very open to that and and that goes from a project to project perspective yeah. okay. so let's uh, shift the focus a bit um, and um, i think it's a new and can you mentioned something very crucial as well so getting more automation in terms of uh, workflow and operational management um, especially when you have uh, high volumes and a lot of data in your system. So um, automation is definitely something that is more and more important, but not just from a workflow point of view. I also see that it's more and more important when it comes to trade execution, uh, that there's a higher level of automation. Uh, for some place in the market, even um, this journey goes towards algorithmic trading. Maybe you can um, share your view on that in terms of how important is automation for your clients and what kind of uh, solutions do you offer and if algorithmic trading is something that your clients are also looking into especially in the more um, specific commodities like metals etc I, I can so, take the first part oh, sorry go, Sita, ahead. go ahead please sorry go, about that. Go ahead. okay so yes automated trading for it, it's essentially not Every client is looking into automated trading, but there are a certain subset of clients that are looking into automated trading, mainly the derivatives business and the people, the hedge funds and the like are, you know, mm -hmm. more interested into that. And so from ETR perspective, you know, being a post trade system, you've got to keep up with it, with the automated trading, which means and getting the deals booked in time and, and valued in time to give them good position view of what is what is going on that way they could you know they could they could keep up with the automated trading so that's where you know the challenge for the ETRM comes in and from uh and trade perspective we are like you know we have a very very good straight through processing mechanism and also we can get in trades quickly into the system and when the trades come in they get valued for the basic you know position attributes that way, you know, if somebody has a position report open on a uh, auto refresh mode, they can see their overall uh, position come come through, and then they can have a view of their portfolio in a in a near real time basis to to you know to work with you know automated system. But does anyone provide trade entry system or trade uh, trading systems that integrate into market? No, we don't. But uh, from a post trade perspective, we do support that kind of business in a very seamless way. And in that context, is your architecture event driven? So you mentioned real time position um, mm -hmm. overview. So is it event driven or is it um, scheduled, manually scheduled? It, it is event driven. So when, the, when the trade okay. comes in, it automatically, in a background way, not necessarily clogging up your system, but trades come in and in the, behind the, the scenes, the, a lot of the pertinent values that are important for position reporting are calculated automatically. Okay, I understand. I think I can expand a little bit more on algo trading in the market trend perspective and then what we are, we sure. are not doing about it, right? So I think Sino was spot on in actually talking about not everybody wakes up from the bed and asks for algo trading. Physical commodities, iron ore and metals is a different ball game in compared to the power and gas, right? I know there are certain uh, companies in the Western Europe where we don't even have one full time actual physical trader who are actually executing uh, power trades and gas trades. Gas trades is still, you can simulate. There are some softwares and expansions. Power trades are much more easy to automate from a standpoint, right? I think our algo trading definitely is picking up a lot of uh, trend or already picked up a lot of trend in the power and gas market. But if you're talking about the really much more physical commodities like an LNG oil or you know global metals, iron ore, and copper, those kind of stuff, I think there's a market has got a long way to go to cash up on it. I'm not saying there is no innovation out there, but the nuances of those contract is extremely bespoke with every time you do a pricing, right? 
gas is gas if you buy european gas today at uh, nbp the price is the same the the copper market or the aluminium market does not work like that so algo trading on that kind of a market need lot more traders knowledge specializations to do pricing and work out the logistics so physical commodities and, and the liquidity yeah and the liquidity, the liquidity yeah. of the market too so right, yeah. gas and power yes even within that gas and power i would just say power is little bit leading on the space of the algo trading then rest of the commodities have to catch up a lot so what you're saying is uh, mainly out of two reasons it's not um picking up so quickly i mean automatic trading in in metals and other commodities it's uh, as understood liquidity which might not be there in the order book and second the complexity of the contracts that do not allow and, and the way the contract the, the way the logistics right so i knows are traded in piles yeah. right you're talking about a pile of cargo which is like could be like i don't know millions of metric tons whatever that may be right and then you have a different sulfur content in the iron ore you have a copper content and then you actually have a dry weight wet weight there's a lot more nuances in actually pricing and managing that physical commodity power is power you generated a grid nominated a tso right and then you can actually automate that depends upon the flow and stuff so i think physical commodity is the bulk ones especially is yeah. liquidity is one element of it and every contract pricing is unique to the counterparty you trade the material you are moving from point a to point b and uh, i would bet my money on it i've been in this in this industry for two decades right now i will be surprised that suddenly three years from now hey metal trading is completely into algo trading I, i'm sure there is a value chain full of it is done but definitely the people's intelligence about the market and the way the market works has to be taken into consideration extreme automation could actually be counterproductive if you don't need it or yeah. the market is not ready for the extreme automation on certain commodities that's my humble view right wow. right now, if i want to summarize that there are some niche players that really do not are not looking for there's no market uh, benefit for going algo but if somebody is doing a natural gas futures trading or just on lme purely financial basis they're hitting back and forth the, those are the people that are looking for algo trading and you know and that is a very small subset of our client base so it, it sounds like you 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 handle quite a bit right you you have this all solution and all these modules are are these is each uh deployment slightly unique in how the modules are mis mixed and matched or is it pretty standard deployment so like is it someone that's just power and gas and it's someone that's buying you know these five commodities is it cuz you know it goes to, it lends itself one to architecture and deployment and then two to the support model those are the two things that come to my mind when you have this this kind of architecture so maybe you could expound upon that a little bit i can take the first pass at it see you can add to it right so i think it's a very great question chris right so we don't i i repeat we don't have power version of entrate gas version of entrate iron ore version of entrate that's the beauty of enrate and entrate we have one solution and one code base which can actually handle multi commodities so when you are buying when you are buying entrate as a solution hey i'm a global lng player today i may do natural gas tomorrow we are not going to come back and tell you hey let's install the natural gas model for you separately after that it is actually built in as a part of the product and it's basically set up your curves set up your deal types which is already as a part of it start trading natural gas new product or a new commodity rollout could be a nightmare for a solution which is actually not built architecturally bottom up from the way of being a multi commodity when anybody was started in 2006 2007 we have been in the market actively from 2008 but the product thinking started in early 2006 we actually want to keep this ethos in mind the ethos is very very simple we are going to take a multi commodity solution and we are going to keep the code base and the functionality intact across all the commodities right if sinu is going to come back and tell me ganesh there is something great going on in the power market i would like to do for the environmentals we just don't go back and say hey let's do that only for the environmentals we always with the help of sinu and the people like sinu in the company we actually go back and say how do we actually learn from an oil market something which could be used in the lng market and metal markets tomorrow right and that's the beauty of entrate and that's the beauty of enwit and we want to keep it that way that actually give us the edge to stay a truly multi commodity solution including the coverage of energy sinu feel free to add 
Yes. So that's the ethos. Like uh, Ganesh said, you know, we want to keep everything same commodity. And if they want to get into another commodity, we don't want to go back and say, you need to buy this module, that module. But all, all that said and done, we don't want this kind of concept to be a problem in the future for deployments and change, change, change management and stuff. That's why we are going towards service-based architecture and microservices. So we will still maintain this ethos, but from deployment perspective, we will go into more microservices-based architecture. That's 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 where our our future is at. And so we're not going to stay, you know, as a big monolithic solution. We are moving towards a more service-based architecture. So from technology perspective, we don't want this ethos to be a liability. We want we want we still want to have the the flexibility of microservices architecture. All right, so that, that makes sense, and I, I get the migration path, and I apologize for, for saying you bundle it and understand that you have a single single solution that you bring out and you deploy. So your new customer base, I mean, there, there is some greenfield, right? You talked about some renewables in the beginning of this conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, are, are your new customers mostly leaving legacy solutions or are they coming, are they greenfields? And if, if they're leaving a legacy, what's the migration path? Like what, what is the differentiator you're going in on? Is it, is it renewable you're coming in on or what, what's the technology that's catching their attention to get you in the door? Great. I think it's a great question. I can, t- I can take about it. I actually look after a lot of sales and pre-sales activities, including delivery within Enovit. I think there are two pocketed questions, Chris. First of all, great question. You're asking, so, so there is always a market, right? So nobody wakes up from the bed and then say, hey, I just ran out on the second side of the bed and then I'm going to buy an ETRM system from anyway today. Nobody does that. That's a fact. So there is a replacement market which is currently pushing the market forward uh, due to some of the m and and consolidation in the market space. I don't need to name anybody, but you, you kind of have the market, right? There are people who are looking for vendors who actually have a solid roadmap to work with, solid partnership to deal with. That's one element of it. The second element you asked me is, let's say there is a replacement market or a dire need. Some of them is a replacement market. Some of them is a green field where people are actually getting into the trading. They want a system. There are two sets of elements which happens. So we are seeing equal amount of leads on the replacement market at the same time, the equal amount of leads on the new market too, right? The ETRM replacement market is actually coming from the fact that a couple of the market leaders, the so-called market leaders is currently under consolidation by a bunch of companies. And then that actually puts the customers with a question saying that, where is my roadmap going? How long I can hang on to the system? Which could actually do, do I get the attention from my account manager? Yes or no. That's one element which is driving the push. The new entrant is also driving the push. So let's answer the question for the, both the sites, right? So when, when anybody does things, I will be very open and then easily talk to you about my implementation methodology in 30 seconds is we basically start the project by with a begin and end in mind, right? Imagine, you know, the, 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 there comes the world where we have run, we all learned programming by writing a hello world. It doesn't exist right now. So when you're going to a client, the first thing you're going to ask is, what's your typical portfolio looks like? Give me your complex traits, right? And s- show me your settlement and confirmation and trade recaps. Just give me a complete insight of your live trades, which are happening today for me to get a sense of your portfolio. Pretty much that's the first question. Any one of us from anybody will ask any customer during the sales process, at the implementation process. That makes it very more interesting for you because I know exactly, oh, that's what you do. This is the way you model it. So basically you fail fast by bringing in the real data at the time of implementation to say, if I'm able to tie out your settlements correctly, manage your risk correctly, you can actually see your position reports and PL report. I almost got the project right from day one or a couple of days from the time. I think that's how we do stuff. And that is why for us, oh, LNG takes six months. Whereas NG takes two months, whereas metal takes one year. We don't have that concept because we go to you and then say, give me your typical portfolio. I would like to model it and start thinking about you are already live today with us. And how do you behave and start training you as a user? So it's almost like a reverse way of implementing it. And that ethos is actually structured in our delivery model. Is that the right thing to say, Sino? Yes, yes. And, you know, absolutely, Ganesh. And to add to it, you know, for a non-greenfield customer that has grown fast and they have a hodgepodge of system, the value proposition for, for getting uh, entered is they can do everything in one one place, one system in a very consistent way. So standardizing the business process and the systems uh, landscape is another major value proposition they're looking at bringing in entry. And we are currently working with two customers very similar to the scenario that I just talked about. Fast growth, 
hodgepodge of systems. I want to get into a more you know streamlined uh, process and and systems uh, environment, and that they you know that's why they're looking at entry. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much. I, I think we've gone through the time that we have on the front end of the program. Uh, we get to switch now to what we call our speed round. Um, what we're going to do in this section of the program is we're going to ask 10 questions. We're going to alternate back and forth. These are just short answers. Yes, no, a sentence or two type questions. Um, I'll go ahead and kick this off and I'll alternate back and forth with Martin. So the first question I have is, will the number of vendors for ETRM solutions shrink or expand in the future? So what we've noticed is it's been a cyclical uh, process where there is a lot of expansion happening and then some consolidation that happens. And what we think now is we are in an expansion phase. At some point in the future, there could be a consolidation. And so it's, it's a cyclical process and we are in an expansion phase. So I think we're just going to expand for a period of time. Okay, thanks. Okay, cool. Second question. How many deals per minute must a modern ETRM system today be capable to import? Especially, I mean, since we talked about automated trading and deal capturing, I think uh, that's where the question is coming from. Uh, I, th I, think, I think if you look at it right now, uh, when it comes to features or the paper trades, it should take a couple of seconds to actually put in the deal, right? When you're talking about the physical deals, uh, natural gas and uh, power, I would just say one or two minutes depends upon how complex your pricing structure is. But if you're talking about the non-energy commodities, like a bulk, you know, LNG or a global coal or iron ore, it's a completely different ballgame to look at it. I, I think there is no direct metrics out there, but paper should take less than a couple of seconds. And then, uh, you know, your standardized uh, vanilla trades like a gas and power without uh, complex, you know, not advanced complexity shape should take not less than a minute in terms of actually keying in by a trader or automated, it should be much, much faster. Right. From algo trading perspective, even hundreds of trades per hundreds minute of trades, should, exactly. should be possible. Exactly. So hundreds of trades per minute. Okay. Yes. Yep. All right. Uh, what commodity types and energy types are you offering and which ones do you consider your biggest strengths? Um, I think I think our product started off with the US natural gas, but we actually offer oil, LNG, coal, metals and stuff. And our strength is actually both energy and bulk commodities. As I said, we do handle multiple commodities. It's almost asking your father, which is your favorite kid? I think we love all of our commodities in Inuit. <laughs> okay. So do you offer a real-time position management module and how many trades can it process? So is it uh, real-time in the sense of event-driven? Yes, it is event-driven. Yes, we have uh, a system like we discussed, you know, it, all the pertinent attributes are calculated as the trades are entered and, you know, if you have a screen open, it will be in, in an auto refresh mode that you could you could see the positions updating, and it can based on the trade type, it can you know on a, if it's on a multi month, it's going to take a few a few seconds, or it could be multiple trades per second if you are uh, if you are doing simple uh, algorithmic trading. Okay, cool. All right, do you have an automated workflow for straight through processing? And absolutely. So we do offer uh, native workflow integration with different market venues like Trayport, ICME, and few other markets. And then also we have an integration workflow within the product to, to enable STP across all of these. Great. Okay. So now a question that comes more from power trading, um, but let's see. Um, so can your ETM solution price Asian options? Yes, it can. It can uh, price Asian option. And we have a very strong quantitative team that, you know, we have uh, proprietary models for um, all the option types that, you know, and we have had uh, clients that are trading very complex options. Okay. So are you offering a full integration and implementation service for your ETM solution? Yes, we do have a uh, full-fledged implementation team. Um, we also work with partners, but we actually have a global implementation team in many locations. Cool. Thank you. Okay. What is the biggest threat for third party ETM solutions from your point of view? So threat or challenge? Yes. So if, if you think of a threat, maybe lack of volatility that slows down the overall market trading and trading activity could could result in people not needing that in existence. But from 
my experience being in this market for 20 years, I've always seen an opportunity arise. If you keep your ears to the ground as an ETM vendor or a solution provider, you will have a value proposition that you can bring into the market in any, any scenario. So opportunities are always there. Challenges are going to arise at the macro level, but then you can still differentiate yourself if you keep your, uh, you know, if you keep your ears on the ground and listen to the client. Okay. Sure. So what is your licensing model like today and do you anticipate it changing in the near future? So we, we offer both uh, perpetual and subscription model depends upon the size, which is like a market trend. Um, does it going to change in the future? Maybe if you start spending more microservices and we are going to actually start uh, splitting the components into a independent, uh, you know, sub modules or sub components, maybe. Is it going to change in the immediate future? I don't think so. Not for, not only for us, but not for the most of the vendors. Okay. Then last question, are you offering APIs and what is the Absolutely. technology behind it? So, so um, it's, it's a RESTful APIs. We all actually offer both microservices and APIs. We have APIs which actually opens our product further to establish the connectedness within our product. Uh, we actually offer web services, RESTful, RESTful APIs, so whatever is the technology you want and then uh, mostly on the Microsoft, but we are platform agnostic in terms of exposing the API. Okay, cool. All right. Well, great. You, you've gone through the gauntlet. We've got you through the 10 questions that we've asked every, every vendor and thank you for participating. Uh, what I like to do at this point as we wind up the show is to give you an opportunity, maybe a minute or two, just to bring it all together. Uh, maybe let our audience know why you know this makes sense and why they might want to contact you, but just let's put the pieces together from the conversation. So if one of you want to kind of bring together the elevator pitch or the, the solution that would be helpful. I think, I think rather than the elevator pitch, I will actually try to be truthful about uh, what we do from a ethos perspective, right? I think I think Innovate is a product company with a services mindset towards focus towards customer, right? What I mean by that is our biggest challenge is try to solve maximum energy and commodity trading and risk management challenges in the marketplace for today and in the future, right? And that takes a lot of discipline. The discipline comes with keeping the product roadmap at the heart of what we do. And uh, from a services side, don't overpromise and undercommit. I, I would actually do uh, underpromise and overcommit is better than the other way around. And then actually try to create value. I We have a leadership team which completely understands. I'm a part of the leadership team. Senior is a part of our leadership team on the product side. We actually understand the commodities in the energy space. That's all we know, right? If you ask me something else, I have no clues what else I will do without, without knowing energy and commodities. So with that in mind, we have a leadership team which supports our product strategy. I, I lead the sales services and support organizations. We know exactly what we are doing with our product and how we serve our product to the customers. I think we are keeping that very close to our heart. For us, if anyone should contact somebody, I think if um, I've been in the marketplace where there are a lot of um, good and bad apples in the system selection and the implementation. People have some good and horrific experiences. If you really want to know how we do things, I think you should give us a call. That's it. Well, great. Well, thank thank you so much for participating on Insider's Guide to Energy each year on mini series. Uh, this concludes another episode uh, for our audience. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. If you do like it, please put a like, make sure you subscribe. And there's plenty of content. I think by the end of this series, there'll be over 25 hours of content. So please uh, go back to the YouTube channel, go back to the website and follow us. Thank you again, gentlemen, for joining the program. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.